On behalf of the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar uh, uh, on using integrated behavioral health to reduce healthcare disparities, primary care behavioral health strategies serving rural populations. Um, with Dr. Philip Howley from the uh, Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. Um, we're so grateful that so many of you could join us today to learn more about this important topic. And we look forward to sharing information and tips and guidance and having an exchange of information with all of you. Uh, my name's uh, Lydia Chwastiak. I am a psychiatrist and professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Washington. I am also one of the co-directors of the uh, Northwest MHTTC. So I'll say a little bit about our center and we'll do some housekeeping before I turn it over to Dr. Holly. Um, so the MHTTC network is a national network of training centers that is uh, uh, sponsored and funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. And our purpose is to support the behavioral health workforce to um, disseminate and implement evidence-based practices for mental uh, health disorders. And the goals of our network include supporting mental health-related evidence-based practices, heightening the awareness, knowledge, and skills of the behavioral health workforce, fostering regional and national alliances, and providing uh, free training and technical assistance on the topic of uh, effective practices for, for mental disorders. Um, the Northwest MHTTC is based at the University of Washington in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and we provide training and technical assistance in evidence-based practices to Region 10, which is Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Um, we provide training on a variety of topics, including um, evidence-based practices for psychosis, suicide prevention, school mental health, peer-related services, and integrated care, which is the topic of today's webinar. And our target workforce includes uh, behavioral health and primary care providers, school and, and social service staff, and, and anyone whose work has the potential to improve behavioral health outcomes for individuals with or at risk for developing serious mental illness. And so just so uh, Dr. Holly has an idea of who's uh, joining us today, maybe take a few minutes as we're getting started to kind of chat in um, yeah, your, your role, where, where you're working, what your role is, so, so he knows who he's talking with. Um, do want to take a few minutes to, uh, before we introduce our speaker and the topic, I, I do want to acknowledge that our Northwest MHTTC is based in Seattle at the University of Washington, and that we sit on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. Um, I also want to remind everyone that uh, it's our intention always to use language that promotes recovery and, is, um, and that fosters respect, human dignity, and hope. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce Dr. Holly. Um, we have made every attempt to make today's presentation secure. Um, if we do need to end the presentation unexpectedly, uh, we'll follow up with you using registration information. Um, it's a large audience today, so all attendees are muted and will not be appearing on video. Um, but the presentation is being recorded. The recording and slides will be made available on our website probably in about uh, two weeks or so, and we'll notify you by email when the, the uh, presentation recording and slides are available. Um, so you'll receive an email about that and also about how to access a certificate of attendance. Um, there are not formal CEUs available, but we will have um, uh, certificates of attendance if, uh, if you're interested in that. Um, there are two functions in Zoom. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Zoom by now. There's a chat function and a Q&A function. We'll ask you to use uh, chat for technical issues, that this will be um, seen only by our MHTTC staff, and they will assist you if you're having technical problems with Zoom. Um, the things posted in the chat are only seen by the training team. They're not seen by anyone else, any of the attendees. Um, if you have questions though, uh, content questions related to the presentation, we will ask you to type those into the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many questions as we can um, at the end of the presentation. There'll be time left at the end of the, um, after the presentation for a Q&A session. So I'll be tracking those and moderate the, the Q&A sessions for Dr. Holly. Um, and if it's possible to, to enter a brief answer, we'll, we'll try to do that in real time. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. 
Um, your feedback is really critical to our work. Uh, so we have a very quick uh, um, a, a evaluation is a survey, probably take two or three minutes to finish. Um, we are required by SAMHSA to conduct the survey, so really appreciate your participation in just filling this out because it helps to support uh, the ongoing availability of, of um, free training and technical assistance such as today's webinar. So at the end of the presentation, um, we'll chat in the link to that survey. It's a REDCap survey. Um, quick disclaimer, I want to acknowledge again that SAMHSA is funding our Northwest MHTTC and all of our training activities. We're very grateful for their support, um, but the presentation today is not, does not represent an official, uh, the official opinion of HHS or SAMHSA. Great, so um, and now I'm really excited to introduce today's uh, uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Howley is a um, primary care is the primary care behavioral health director at the Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. Uh, he is a licensed clinical psychologist and has worked in primary care uh, for the past six years. Um, he manages the primary care behavioral health program, which consists of 17 behavioral health consultants across Washington and Oregon. Uh, and these are uh, clinicians who provide behavioral health service within the PCBH model of integration. Um, so, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Holly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lydia. Yeah, I I really appreciate everybody chiming in. And I, I think as I was keeping track a little bit, we've got maybe a dozen or more different states and, and areas kind of uh, represented and just such a, a great turnout. So I do really appreciate everybody uh, being here today and, and taking some time to, to listen about some of the things that we've been doing in Washington and Oregon and really trying to understand the best ways that we can uh, help our patients, especially those who uh, interacting with the specialty behavioral health system has been historically challenging. So I am going to share my presentation here. Could someone let me know if they can see this? I think we have it all worked out, but okay, good. All right. So I, I first wanted to start off this last, you know, 12 months, 14 months has been a time of unprecedented change, uh, challenges, uh, just devastating impact. I, I'm not sure really I have words to describe exactly what 2020 has been. And uh, I was listening to a, a fellow psychologist, Dr. Christine Runyon, uh, speak a little bit about this. And, and this quote really kind of resonated with me. And so I just wanted to start with just some time to, to kind of reflect on the last year and those who have been doing just such wonderful work within uh, our healthcare system. So her quote is that no amount of sophisticated technology can do what health professionals have done these past few months offered care with uncertain evidence, sat with the dying, comforted family members from afar, held one another in fear and grief, celebrated unexpected recoveries, and simply showed up. We have asked and expected clinicians to show up in ways they were never trained to do. No one has been trained in how to emotionally manage months of mass casualties, no one has been trained on how to keep showing up despite feeling feckless on the job. No one has been trained how to keep regular life afloat at home and anxiety at bay while working day after day with a little known biohazard. And it's really just even scratches the surface of the magnitude of what we've all been dealing with and Maybe if there's a, a way of feeling connected with one another, this year has been a reminder that as I look through that list, I'm sure whether you're in Texas or Mississippi or Alaska, uh, the Northeast, Chicago, I saw in there, uh, we've all had to make adjustments due to the coronavirus. And I just appreciate so much those who have been helping others and, and really working towards a day where this may be something we can kind of look back on rather than continuing to look forward 
to another day. So in our discussion today, I really want to talk about what primary care behavioral health is. And a big part of that is through the lens of addressing healthcare disparities and uh, healthcare barriers that integrated behavioral health was from its inception really designed to better address why the specialty behavioral health system wasn't able to really adequately address the needs of all of our patients. So that will be a big point of what we want to accomplish today and, and really looking at what that means to do primary care behavioral health, some of the details of what that looked like, and even some opportunities to discuss some individual uh, case examples of what this model looks like in action. Also pulled a quote from Neftali Serrano. So he's the CEO of the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association. And I thought this was another good summary of as a BHC and, and what integrated behavioral health is focusing on is, is really almost this foundational difference in, in what we do. And so his quote was, our community is a rarity in the healthcare world. We do not represent a guild. We do not represent a sector of the healthcare industry. We do not represent a disease category. We represent an idea. That idea is that healthcare works best when professionals in tandem with families and their communities work together within systems that support their together work. That's why our mission is to support healthcare professionals in integrating physical and behavioral health. Within the organization that I work for, the Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic, we use the primary care behavioral health model of integration. And our behavioral health professionals are titled behavioral health consultants, and they work within our primary care clinics to address uh, really the, the full spectrum of primary care needs. Uh, and that includes physical health conditions as well as uh, mental health conditions. Each BHC sees over a or has over a thousand visits a year. And we really recognize a need to be innovative in our delivery and uh, ways to make sure that we are addressing those healthcare barriers to ensure that we are uh, really talking about the different aspects of, of behavioral health and how that impacts the overall health of each patient. This data is actually uh, a couple of years old, but it was the only year that I had the information across our full service line. And so it's another important part in recognizing the different settings of behavioral health. So when we look at our primary care behavioral health system, I think the, the intro showed that we have uh, a couple more BHCs in our system now and have added to the number of clinics that they provide that service in. But at this time, it was 16 providers and 13 clinics with 22,000 visits across 15,000 different people. We also offer specialty behavioral health in Yakima County in Washington. And within our outpatient behavioral health setting, we have another 30 counselors. And those 30 counselors see uh, 2,000 patients with about 25,000 visits. And then we have our most intensive services. So these are things like wraparound services or uh, some other kind of direct service focused on uh, usually at risk youth. And within that group, we have 21 employees and they're meeting with 300 different people annually. So what we see across these different kind of levels of care is that we have uh, a fairly similar number of employees, but we're providing more time with less people as we move to the specialty level and the intensive services. And so with this, uh, a BHC is actually able to see about 15 times the number of people that a traditional behavioral health provider does, and over 60 times as many people as uh, an intensive service. So we're really looking at a broader range uh, of behavioral health, 
And we're doing that to really address the full patient population that we work with. Here is a, a geographic region of our clinics across Washington and Oregon. And we are really to a point of having uh, at least one BHC in almost all of our clinics across the organization. And this has really uh, grown over the last few years. When I started with the organization, I was working in our Toppenish clinic and I was the fifth BHC on our team. So we've nearly quadrupled in that amount of time. And that's been not only as we've had more BHCs brought into different clinics, but also as our organization has opened up new clinics and spread into other service areas. Behavioral health integration is an important topic for us to talk a little bit more about because it comes in a lot of different forms. And the education about what these different forms looks like it is something that, that doesn't always get talked about in a lot of detail. In some cases, uh, there are organizations who might hire a therapist, give them an office, and tell them to kind of be ready for referrals. We're going to send people your way. Uh, and so those could be things kind of looking more towards a co-located model of physically locating specialty mental health within a clinic space. Uh, we also have things like the collaborative care model of integration, where a case manager and a psychiatrist, usually a psychiatrist is working off-site, uh, are part of a team in managing a target population, uh, which the, the AIM Center, uh, UW, really has uh, some of its biggest focus on depression, although there are other areas in uh, looking at, at the collaborative care model within other target populations as well. But when we look to integrated primary care or the primary care behavioral health model, the definition of this or how to define this really kind of focuses on a, a combination of, of medical and behavioral health service for problems patients bring to primary care, including stress-linked physical symptoms, health behavior, mental health, substance use disorders, for any problem, they have come to the right place. There's no wrong door policy and behavioral health professionals are used as a consultant to their primary care colleagues. I think this really hits on why this is such an effective strategy in rural settings and why it really hits at some of the main difficulties of challenges that patients experience in trying to navigate the traditional specialty behavioral health system. That their primary care, their family doctor, uh, or even just a clinic in their town might be the place that a patient is most likely to present regardless of what types of symptoms they're having. In some cases, those are physical health symptoms that have overlap with a mental health condition. In some cases, their mental health symptoms and patients just don't know where else to go or don't have the ability to travel or access traditional mental health services in, uh, in other ways. So this is really kind of ensuring that we have people where patients are at to figure out what they need and what's going on to make sure that primary care is kind of running more efficiently but also that we're facilitating the needs of patients in these situations. A big part of working in primary care is being a part of the primary care culture and a part of the clinic space. So in looking at uh, kind of what this looks like here, I have our BHCs represented by the pink or kind of fuchsia circles and the primary care providers as the orange squares. And this is actually some diagrams of what a few of our different clinics are, are kind of laid out. But the idea here is that we are really closely located to the PCPs in the day-to-day -day workflows. And that as concerns come up in a primary care visit, uh, a primary care provider often just has to turn and look to the BHC to say, hey, I really would like you to see this patient or in some cases, send us a message, depending on uh, kind of where we're at with those things. But we really want to be physically present in the primary care workflows 
to ensure that this is something that that works very seamlessly that we're kind of on providers minds as an option when these things come up and that we're making it very simple for a patient when a medical provider sees a patient in the exam room and a behavioral health concern comes up a bhc will then go into that exact same exam room and talk with a patient following the medical appointment to ensure they don't have to get up they don't have to be taken to a different space uh, they don't have any additional stigma of being taken to the behavioral health department or the wing of the clinic or even just a, a different space that might indicate something else is going on for this patient that's different from treatment as usual. We also want to look towards being more specific about what primary care behavioral health is. And we do that through uh, the GATHER acronym as a way of really measuring the different things that we should be able to say we're doing when we are doing uh, primary care behavioral health. So this focuses on the G, which is generalist. So we're seeing people across the lifespan and we're seeing them for all types of behavioral health and physical health conditions. Being accessible, so that's a big part of that, being in the clinic space. But the majority of our, our BHC services are happening same day, uh, typically as a patient is either waiting to see their primary care provider or immediately after. Although we can also schedule appointments and certainly over the last 12 months have been offering many more virtual either telephone or video options and I'll kind of discuss how we've made those adjustments uh, in a few slides. We want to be a part of the team. Uh, being a part of what primary care looks like, being a part of uh, the, the annual metrics that primary care is responsible for, and really trying to match what primary care has done so well for a long time, but bringing a behavioral health perspective to that. BHCs, and, and I think this is a huge part of why integration is different in some ways from specialty in that comparison of the levels of service, is that because we do more brief intervention, shorter visits, we want to see more people over, uh, over what would be seen in specialty behavioral health. And so part of that's through our productivity, uh, that we try to see 10 or more patients every day. We also want to be an educator in the clinic. Many times a BHC is helpful to patients that they haven't seen because they provide education to other clinic staff, to medical providers, uh, or, to, uh, or to other people who, who they might be interacting with. And we're also looking to develop new pathways. There are so many aspects to behavioral health and what patients bring to primary care that we still need to work towards ways of developing better workflows and really ensure that we're doing things to improve that process for our patients. In looking at the differences between primary care behavioral health and the specialty behavioral health system, a few of the big differences that show up are, we really are focused on the full patient population where specialty behavioral health uh, will tend to look towards a target population or even a caseload for a specific therapist. Uh, BHCs are, are really working with the entire clinic population. Also, as part of that consultant role, the primary care providers are really some of the, the, the main people we're looking towards to ensure that we're helping them in their day-to-day -day process. And then as a, a secondary piece to that, or kind of a 1A, uh, the patient is then kind of the, the next step of we are providing this intervention and, and working with patients as a extension to what their primary care providers would be doing where in the specialty system, the patient is the, the primary focus with others following that. In our goals, we're looking to really improve primary care as a whole. Uh, in some cases, that's helping with the kind of efficacy and efficiency of the day-to-day -day workflows. And we're also looking to help patients and their providers work towards their overall health goals as well. 
In traditional mental health, we, we might be looking more specifically at an individual patient's health issues and, and resolving those. Uh, I mentioned this before, but we, we use kind of a, a more brief uh, service delivery, uh, shorter number of sessions, a uh, shorter amount of time with each patient, um, but really working towards the idea of education, self-management, and being present-centered, kind of what can we do today to, to address some of these symptoms. Traditional mental health uh, uses the 50-minute hour. Uh, often we'll be seeing people for uh, a longer period of time, in some cases, you know, 10 or more sessions, and is really focused on kind of the ideology and insight of uh, the things going on. And then at the end of the day, the primary care providers are still the ones who are uh, in charge of the patient care, and that's different from the specialty model as well. So in looking to these two things, it's kind of a, a balance of how do we set these goals and how do we do this to make sure we're providing uh, behavioral health across so many people who in other ways may never access the behavioral health system. Part of that also comes with the why of what we do. And a huge part of this is because the prevalence of mental illness in our country, and in this particular instance, the region that I work in, is too much for our specialty behavioral health system to adequately address. Um, there are more people with symptoms of depression and anxiety, substance use disorders, uh, and other conditions than then our specialty system is able to see. And so integrated behavioral health really allows us to provide options for people who may not be able to seek out services in another way. And the mental health in America uh, has Washington and Oregon ranked as 46th and 51st across the, the state. So still some really big challenges here and how do we truly address the needs of our region. So in looking at that prevalence, uh, what we can see is that primary care behavioral health allows us to really push the limits of how many people do have access. And so this is one of our, our biggest strengths that we've been able to year after year uh, have an intervention and, and contact with thousands of people even to the extent of over 100,000 BHC visits since 2015. And we're seeing you know, more than 10,000 different people on a year-to-year -year basis. And this has been a team of between about 12 and 18 people uh, kind of throughout that time. So a, a relatively small group for these types of numbers. And so in doing that, we saw that Washington and Oregon are really at the bottom of the list when it comes to the prevalence or top of the list, however you wanna kind of look at that. But when it comes to access, we kind of start to push the trends here that Washington and Oregon are 16th and 21st. So this means that there is a significant number of people in our region who are accessing behavioral health. And I think this is an indicator of the success that we've had in ensuring that there is a place for people to go regardless of uh, socioeconomic status, rural locations, transportation, uh, that we try to make this as easy for people as possible. And, uh, and I think it's starting to show in, in this data that people in Washington and Oregon have met with a behavioral health person. And sometimes that's in a specialty setting and, and sometimes it's at their doctor's office. And both of those things can be very effective. So when we do meet with someone, and, and I think this is where uh, we also want to be clear about the idea that uh, a behavioral health consultant or even the term behavioral health is really a, a broad term. And it's looking not just at the mental health conditions or substance use conditions, but it's also looking at so many physical health conditions that have a behavioral component to them. So those could be things like adjustment. They could be things, uh, headaches, chronic pain, fibromyalgia. Uh, when we look at, at grief and bereavement, uh, weight loss, and uh, just making health change 
in some cases, a new diagnosis is something that is incredibly stressful and difficult for a patient. And being diagnosed with something is not typically what we would refer someone to outpatient counseling for, but having some support and some, some simple interventions to identify why that change is difficult and helping them be successful in managing their health is a really important thing that we can do with the patients that we see. Mm. Yeah, so the question kind of comes in here about um, higher prevalence com coming from the, the idea of the more work that we're doing. And the more we're asking about behavioral health, the more that we might be uncovering some of the things going on. I certainly think that can be part of it, although there are efforts to better understand the true prevalence regardless of what's happening in, uh, in primary care. And so I'd say that might explain some of those shifts, but in many cases, the, especially even like with the mental health in America, there's additional surveys and polls that are going out to people, whether they've interacted with their primary care system or not. So uh, I would also say, it's just become more socially acceptable to talk about things like depression and anxiety. Culturally, we're moving more towards uh, those types of conversations being at least accepted. Uh, there's certainly is still a lot of stigma in regards to talking about mental health, talking about substance use, but we are really seeing a trend where talking about what we're feeling, talking about uh, addiction, are things that are really encouraged more in 2021 than they were in 2010 or 2000 for that matter. So I think that's been another part is we're, we're only really starting to pull back the curtain and fully grasp the situation of what mental health really looks like in, in our country. So in 2020, we saw uh, just shy of 15,000 unique people and this hit a, a full organizational uh, population reach of 12%. So that means across everyone that farm workers see, uh, 12 out of 100 were seen by a BHC in that year. Based on specific clinics where our BHCs work, uh, that fell down to about a 7% at some of our biggest clinics that have just a couple of BHCs working. And in the clinics where there is uh, one or two BHCs and the number of medical providers is uh, not as different, we were actually even able to see an excess of 20% of patients seen. So that means one in five people coming to those clinics had met with a BHC that year. And being able to uh, have some kind of contact with 20% of a population is the types of interventions that we're going to have to really look towards to address these big numbers of prevalence and especially the growing mental health need following uh, COVID and the impact that that's had on our communities as well. So the unique patients is just the number of different patients during the year. So it just means 14,687 different people. Uh, so that was at uh, 17,867 encounters. So I guess some quick math there will tell you then that most of our patients saw a BHC once. Uh, and, and really that's pretty consistent with a lot of data is that the modal number of visits that we'll get with someone is one. Uh, the average is between one and two, but uh, many times when we're meeting with someone, that's going to be our one time of seeing them at least within uh, like a, a year time frame, We also track a lot of other things that we do in our health record because we know they're important to the patient care experience. So those were telephone calls at least prior to our telephone calls being a uh, like a true visit where it might be more like care coordination type telephone calls uh, where we would document things in a patient's chart uh, and sometimes those could be things like consulting with a doctor, but without a patient visit. I had mentioned sometimes a BHC will help 
with MA staff or medical staff in their future interactions. And so this could be a great example where we might document that we discussed a patient with a provider so that they could talk about some things or they could modify their future visits with that patient. And if you add in those additional, uh, what we call patient touches, the additional documentations, we were able to have 25,000 different like patient care activities if you then add the, the visits that we had plus the additional documentation. So for 2020, we really experienced a lot of change. And I know this is not unique to us, but uh, you do not have to be a mathematician or a statistician to see that something happened in March of 2020. Our ability to see people in person plummeted. And we, I, I'm incredibly proud of this, but we were able to really shift towards seeing people in other formats in a way um, that was really organizationally well supported and, uh, and was also kind of helpful in connecting with these patients who very much wanted to meet with someone, but were not always able to, to come into the clinic or even able to come to the clinic based on COVID precautions. A question, question did come up about, um, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to some of the billing stuff towards the end. Um, but what we've seen over the last few months is that there have been more uh, efforts to uh, bring some people back into the clinic vaccinations are kind of rolling forward and we're certainly being careful in the precautions that we're still taking, but it was somewhere in between uh, September and October that we then started to have more in-person visits than our telephone or video visits. And, uh, and that's continued, although um, we're still seeing somehow that might kind of play out over the upcoming months. And I'm not sure anyone really knows exactly what the right amount of uh, in-person to virtual options are really going to, to play out in the future. The other question when it comes to these things, we uh, looked at a, a video visit. So these were uh, audio and video simultaneously in 2018 and 2019. We're a little bit ahead of the curve in starting to pilot some of what this looked like. And what we saw was that we actually got a very similar response in the uh, symptom reduction for patients who met with a BHC in, in those settings. So what we saw was uh, really across the, the different visits that we had in our pilot project uh, were that about um, 30%, 33% showed reduction on the PHQ-9. So that would have been a, uh, a reduction of five points or more. And then we did see uh, a much more significant group that was in that zero to four reduction. And so that's that 53 or 58%. So there still was a, a decent amount of people who showed smaller changes, but not enough to say it was clinically uh, significant. And similarly with uh, anxiety symptoms on the GAD7, we saw uh, almost identical uh, splits here between those who met with a BHC through a video or who met with the BHC live. And again, this is a, a five point reduction on the GAD7 uh, and that other bigger group there, the 60, 61% were the ones that had either a zero point reduction all the way up to a four point reduction. In looking at the patients that we see, one of the other things that's been important is uh, really recognizing the patients that you're working with. Uh, this was a, a project that I did last year and it came from Medicare wellness visits and the, the real need to, to do a better job of cognitive screening for patients. So I started to look at CMS guidelines. I even looked to Washington State and Yakima County guidelines. And what I actually found was that our clinic in Toppenish, our patient population didn't match too well with 
uh, those more general statistics. And I think this is probably true for a lot of our rural clinics. And it would be something I would really recommend to people in that you really need to take time to better understand the patients that you're working with before you try to use a, a cookie cutter approach to who you might be seeing. And one of the big things in this was uh, the patient population that I work with is, has a, a lower level of education and speaks Spanish at a higher rate than even our county uh, accounts for, and especially compared to national averages. And so we were really seeing a pretty significant number of people who had less than a high school education and quite a few people who uh, were, were not speaking English. Uh, that, that means monolingual Spanish speakers. And the actual average grade level for Spanish speaking patients was two years, so second grade. And 21 patients had told us they had never had any formal education, so less than one year. So this was really a big difference and it was very eye-opening to me that we needed to adjust some of our clinical workflows, not to match national guidelines or even state guidelines, but to match the patients that we were working with. I had mentioned this before, but uh, one of the other things that's so important is really kind of matching what we are talking about with what we're actually doing. And through that, we've been able to look more specifically at uh, the idea of how we should be a generalist. And we did that through looking at the different types of conditions that BHCs uh, see during the year. And one of the things that came from this was that each day, a BHC saw about five different diagnoses. And, and really, we felt like that hit well with the idea of we see a broad range of different conditions, and, and that's something that we want to make sure that we're highlighting as an important part of why what we do is across that full spectrum. Really making sure that we are not narrowing in too far on any particular BH, uh, any particular diagnosis or diagnosis group. We want to see people across all of these different conditions. So this was our full team on one month of just kind of breaking down the different visits and the diagnoses connected to those. And so as you can see, our, our big ones are kind of depression, anxiety, and, and stress, but we really see people across so many different conditions. And there's a lot of projects that might focus on a particular target group. But what I love about this is by being in primary care and being a generalist, we're able to provide a level of service for people uh, where there may not be a specialty option. Things like autism, things like uh, different um, conditions within eating disorders, parenting, uh, gender dysphoria or tran transgender, or all the full LGBTQ population. Uh, those are things that a qualified specialist in a rural area most likely doesn't exist. And sending someone on a referral to start that conversation isn't always feasible for everyone. So BHCs are able to start that conversation. They're able to provide education. They're able to provide helpful skills and, and still work towards getting that person to a, a more kind of specialty setting. But when that isn't possible, we at least ensure that they're getting something in, in primary care. Uh, and then things that were less common here is kind of a, another group uh, of diagnoses that only came up, you know, just one or two times, but uh, within that one month. And, and of course, COVID-19 and new diagnoses and, and really kind of talking to people about having that condition, the adjustments, the, the sacrifice that came with what it was like to be sick is something that we, uh, we had a lot of our visits in 2020 with patients and caregivers of those who, who did get sick or, or pass away. So in looking at what we do, I think this is the next part is, these are shorter visits, it's kind of fast paced. How do you really do the things that can be helpful? And, and I think it's an important part that we kind of keep hitting on that, uh, that BHG still use evidence-based skills that we really want to, to do some of those things in a more abbreviated format, but we're not deviating from the types of things that we know can be effective for people. So most commonly, we're looking to interventions that kind of fall within behavioral strategies, 
cognitive behavioral therapy, or acceptance and commitment therapy. In looking at some of the interventions within ACT, uh, this is something that works across uh, a few different kind of conditions uh, and really has been uh, some good strategies to teach people within primary care. But what we want to be looking at with ACT is kind of shifting our mindset away from trying to challenge our thoughts, trying to change what we're thinking, and really kind of learning ways to kind of separate from what we're thinking and focus more on value congruent behaviors as opposed to symptom reduction. So uh, some kind of measures of functioning or activities of daily living, those types of things are the types of things we would really want to measure in these types of interventions, rather than how much, you know, maybe that PHQ score changed for a patient like this. Although it's not uncommon that as people are doing more value congruent things, that their symptoms get better as well. And so this can be done through teaching acceptance, teaching diffusion techniques, mindfulness or, or present, kind of being present uh, exercises, committed action or those uh, values, uh, congruent behaviors, and also just kind of understanding the self as, as uh, context and really a lot of patient education just on how our bodies work. And, and this is a, a big part of this too, is the, the acceptance of we are all kind of on this planet and dealing with things that we many times can't control. And so often patients struggle with some of these ideas of how do we change what we're feeling or try to feel better now and learning ways to accept that or be more compassionate to ourselves can be incredibly helpful. Diffusion really is that idea of recognizing our thoughts as something that's happening in our body rather than something that's about who we are. And there's some, some good skills on teaching these types of things for, for patients as well. Mentioned uh, just trying to find ways to commit to, to more value congruent behaviors and, and really encouraging those types of things. Mindfulness and be present. Uh, I did want to hit on a few other things. So within CBT, we certainly talk a lot about uh, recognizing thoughts. We use thought journals. We use uh, ways of challenging our, our negative thoughts and, and using some of those strategies as well. I use a lot of behavioral strategies for parents and kind of making sure that we're talking about uh, positive reinforcement, appropriate discipline for children, and really a lot of just routine setting and structure for our younger kids who, who need that as part of their development. But I wanted to kind of bring in a couple of examples here for just a minute or two and kind of talk through what uh, at least a part of a day might look like. So a patient might be coming in and the doctor meets with them and uh, one year well child check, things are going well no complications and no concerns. The provider might go in on that visit and is unlikely to, to suggest that a BHC would meet with that patient because things are going great. We also have maybe the next patient, a 56 year old male to discuss high blood pressure and low back pain. Uh, this is something that uh, could be an option to be treated through surgery but the surgeons told this patient that they're gonna to need to quit smoking and they've been smoking about a pack per day. So it'd be a great time for a BHC to come in, do some interventions on smoking cessation and help them kind of work towards at least being eligible for this other treatment option, as well as discussing what other types of things they could do to cope with back pain. And then patient number three. Uh, so this is for diabetes and uh, their diabetes has um, an A1C of 8.1, and it's been going up kind of over the last six months to an 8.8. .8. So in this case, uh, it would be great to, to kind of screen out other mental health conditions, identify things that might be playing into what might be leading to this increase in blood sugar. Sometimes that's changes in routines, stress, uh, or just education about things that can be helpful. And so a BHC has really a variety of different interventions that might uh, come into play about how does this patient better understand their condition and make changes to, to better manage that. So I will bring us back to the group and start to look at the things you guys have been saying. 
just want to thank you for a, a wonderful presentation and sharing the wonderful work. It's amazing how, how how much reach you've had with this model across all of the clinics. Um, we do have a couple of questions. One was the, the question about funding. Um, so I think the specific question was about the not face-to-face, -face, what of that is billable, but just in general, maybe kind of saying a bit more about how how the BHCs yeah. are funded. So I think my simple strategies to people is diversity is a good thing when it comes to our, our billing and revenue uh, income streams. Um, so we use a combination of uh, reimbursable activities from our, our BHCs as well as grant activities and also partnerships with individual payers. So we are across two different states. And so that's definitely something that um, we see, I wanna say probably eight or 10 different state-based Medicaid uh, insurances. We see private insurance, we see Medicare. Uh, and so there really is a, a wide variety. And I wish the answer to this was, they all pay the same for the same codes. But that is just not the case. And so in certain situations, and you brought up a really good one here with uh, especially situations where we're not having visits with patients, those are more commonly not reimbursed. Uh, and so that's something where we are really trying to balance that with uh, having more of the, the billable services. And so typically those are going to be uh, those 16 to 37 minute visits that we'll have with patients. And those could be done with the psychotherapy codes or we use health and behavior codes if someone like that last example about diabetes. Uh, if they don't have a mental health condition, we would use one of the health and behavior codes for those types of visits. And we've really found that combination of uh, partnerships with payers, uh, billable services with the codes that we can submit and grant services. So I guess a good example was that that initial tele-BHC project was grant funded. And so between all of those, um, and maybe this is a big part of my job, is to make sure that this is a program that's sustainable and keeps growing and continue to advocate at groups like this and at the state and federal level that we're not there yet. I, I don't think we get reimbursed for the impact that we make, um, but it's getting better. And it's definitely something that I'm going to keep talking about. And I love to keep talking about because I think what we do brings a value to the healthcare system that is is still only partially understood. Yeah, no, that's great. And that's that's why we're here is to help get, get the word out and disseminate the model and have people thinking about it. Um, we, we do have time for a couple more questions. I do want to remind everyone about the evaluation. Rebecca has uh, put the link in the chat. So if you're taking off early, please take the two minutes to fill out the evaluation. But a couple of questions relate to um, both the uh, educational or licensure levels of the VHCs that probably is connected to what's billable. Um, and then this yeah. interesting question about personal qualities. What, what, what makes a good VHC? Um, so maybe yeah. you can speak to those. Uh, well, that's a tricky one. I'm, I'm gonna have to say, I wish I knew an exact answer for that. But when it comes to our licensure, um, we kind of historically have been a little bit more psychologist heavy and that's been some PsyDs and some PhDs. Although we have had marriage and family therapists social workers, and master level uh, counselors as well. I know the terms for that are different from state to state, but um, a full kind of variety across the master's level and doctorate level conditions. And I will definitely tell you, that is not what makes a good BHC. We have awesome doctorate level ones and we have awesome master's level ones. So your education and training programs are probably a factor in kind of what makes a good BHC, but there is certainly not any specific credential that's a, a good fit for somebody. I think it's much more about the personality of the individual person. There are some differences, I'm sure as you noticed, about just kind of the workflow, the pace of primary care, and maybe even a comfort in working in a medical setting with a variety of different conditions. And so it, it's not something that a BHC needs to be perfect at day one, but they do need to be flexible and have a willingness to learn and be a part of a team. Uh, that, that it's definitely a collaborative effort. And uh, I have not seen a BHC who wanted their own space. They didn't wanna to talk to other people. They just wanted people to be sent to them and to do kind of their thing. 
that, that really is difficult in, in a setting like this where we're, we're really pushing to be integrated and being part of primary care. And so a big part of that is a willingness to work and work well with a big group of people. I think a, a couple questions specifically about substance use disorders. So um, I think that was on the list you sort of mentioned, you know, kind of, but can you speak more about how BHC might work? Are there specific yeah. strategies or how that might so, be handled, how substance use prevention and maintenance? So I, think I really think about primary care, uh, I guess I've used the analogy, it's integration is like building a house. And I think PCBH is the foundation but I will also be really clear that those other integration models and target population focus, I think is kind of the next phase. We've piloted a couple of things where we've had an integrated substance use professional and it's helped with uh, also having that added piece for like dual diagnoses situations and still doing some of those assessments and intervention in house. And they've also been helpful in managing patients who have some, uh, medications that they've been taking for either kind of re avoiding relapse or uh, or kind of working out of an addiction kind of uh, pattern. So, so I think it's one of those things where the substance use disorder and SUDP world, I think is a really great complement to this system. And I would say even from my own experience, I, I feel pretty comfortable working with a lot of different uh, substance use conditions, but I know I've have more training when it comes to some of these other things. And if we can do kind of a better job of addressing all of those needs, I think that's gonna really be the next wave of integration is we want generalists and then we want some sort of added specialty focus to, to really kind of beef up those, those target populations who need more time and need more, uh, more intervention than we're able to do in this model. No, that's great. Well, thank you again for a really terrific presentation. We appreciate everyone uh, spending an hour with us this afternoon to hear about this important topic. Uh, reminder to everyone that the third and final webinar in this series on integrated care is by our colleagues from the Lumi Tribal Health Clinic uh, in Northwest Washington. So we'll be hearing about them. Uh, we'll be hearing from them on April 12th. So we'll look forward to seeing everyone there. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us about resources at the Northwest uh, MHTTC. And uh, this presentation will be available uh, in about two weeks. So we will send you um, an email when the presentation is available. So thank you again, Dr. Howley. It was wonderful to hear about your work. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, I really appreciate these opportunities. If, if you can't tell, I love what I do. And if there's anything we need, it, it's just more people who have a passion for working with our behavioral health population. and and really working towards health equity. Great, thanks everyone for joining. We'll see you next time.